Good morning. I will start with general questions this morning. Question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling poverty, including fuel poverty, in the Kilmarnock and Irvine Valley constituency. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, the Scottish Government is taking action to tackle poverty across all of Scotland with the resources and powers available to us. The Fairer Scotland Action Plan sets out 50 concrete actions that we will take over this parliamentary term to deliver on our ambitions for a fairer Scotland. Tackling fuel poverty has always been a priority for this government and by the end of 2021 we will have committed over £1 billion to making our homes and buildings warmer and cheaper to heat. We have also committed to introducing a Warms Home Bill uh, to tackle uh, fuel poverty. Uh, we do not hold figures for constituency areas, but the Scottish Government fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes have spent approximately £23 million in improving domestic energy efficiency and tackling fuel poverty across the three Ayrshire Council areas uh, since 2012. Willie Covey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome that substantial ind additional investment that uh, she mentioned there to tackle this. And I, I do hope that will mean a significant extra investment in my constituency on top of the existing measures we have brought in to help those in fuel poverty. Is the Cabinet Secretary able to say when she might be able to respond to the strategy group's recommendation to change the definition of fuel poverty so that we can do more where it's required? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the uh, Fuel Poverty Strategy Group uh, and the fuel, Rural Fuel Poverty Working Group between them made 100 uh, recommendations, uh, which is a government we are currently uh, working through. In terms of the specific issues uh, in and around uh, the change to fuel poverty and the definition of uh, fuel poverty, we will of course work very closely firstly with the uh, Fuel Poverty Forum uh, to agree uh, the scope of the review uh, and we will commission that work as soon as possible and we expect uh, the review uh, to be completed uh, within the first half of next year. But I do want to be clear, presiding officer, that this does not mean that we will define uh, fuel poverty away and any changes which come out uh, of the independent review must be justified and ensure that those in need receive the most support. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government if it recognises the importance of the third sector in tackling issues like poverty, uh, organisations like Centre Stage, Mormon Day Services, the Holiday Project and East Ayrshire Churches Homelessness Action, to name but a few in the Kilmarnock and Northern Valley constituency. And will the Scottish Government ensure that East Ayrshire Council and the councils across Scotland are properly funded so they in turn can ensure these vital charities in our communities are fully supported? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I thank Mr Little for his question. We certainly do recognise the importance of the third sector in tackling poverty uh, and I would like to commend uh, Centre Stage for the very innovative and person-centred work that they do. Uh, I know that Ms Freeman uh, has recently visited uh, that particular project. As a government, we uh, have invested £24 billion this financial year in the third sector. <laughs> it is, of course, um, imperative that local government and the third sector uh, work together and collaborate. And in terms of fuel poverty, there is some great uh, innovation uh, in the social enterprise sector uh, that involves uh, registered social landlords and housing associations in particular. Uh, and I point to the example of uh, Our Power, uh, which is a social enterprise led uh, by a housing association uh, that uh, is supplying uh, power and energy to its tenants, saving hundreds of tenants hundreds of pounds a year. And that's uh, another uh, sterling example along with centre stage. Question number two, Claire Hockey. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it will take forward plans to establish a national manufacturing institute. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Scotland has a proud manufacturing heritage and manufacturing has, of course, the potential to be a key driver of our future prosperity through global exports. The creation of a National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland is an ambitious proposal which is aimed at shaping the future of manufacturing and innovation in Scotland. As stated in a plan for Scotland, the Scottish Government's programme for Government 2016-17, a key action for this year will be developing the business case for the Na National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. 
We have taken a multi-partner approach which includes Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Scottish Funding Council, Skills Development Scotland, Zero Waste Scotland and the Scottish Government in developing the business plan for the Institute and this work includes evidence, uh, building an evidence base and working closely with the private sector on the detail of the proposition. Clear hockey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. My constituency of Rutherglen has a wide range of family-run and medium-sized manufacturing businesses, including sack makers, switchboard and electrical manufacturers, ventilation products and food manufacturers, to name a few. It's also home to the Shawfield Business Park, currently being developed by uh, Clyde Gateway as part of the National Business Strategy. Has the Government considered a location for the National Manufacturing Institute? And if not, can I suggest that Rutherglen is the perfect location? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I listen very carefully to what the member says and the excellence of some of the activity that's ongoing in Rutherglen, but I should say that as part of developing the business case for a new uh, manufacturing institute for Scotland, options for the centre's location will be considered as part of that business case process. But wherever the institute is located, we are determined, of course, it will be for the benefit for the whole of Scotland. But I do listen very closely to what the member said. Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. The, the Government's uh, Manufacturing Action Plan, published early this year, also promised, amongst other things, an enhanced manufacturing advisory capital asset survey, also by quarter two, 2016, and by quarter three, that Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Isles Enterprise would have implemented a workplace innovation service aimed at workforce engagement. Can the Cabinet Secretary inform Parliament where these initiatives lie? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I can, and I thank uh, Richard uh, Leonard for the question. So, on the 18th of March, Zero Waste Scotland launched, uh, first of all, the £18 million Circular Economy Fund for Business. On the 1st of June, the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service launched the new Capital Asset Review Service, to which uh, Richard Leonard uh, referred. And also, on the 22nd of August, Scottish Enterprise launched the new Workplace Innovation Service. So, you can see that we are making real progress uh, on this in trying to revitalise and assist, where possible, manufacturing in Scotland. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. We welcome the plans to establish a national manufacturing institute. We hope that it helps to improve Scotland's productivity from the current levels in the third quartile. Can the Cabinet Secretary please tell me when will he announce new targets for Scottish productivity going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, once again, I think it would be useful when we have questions from the Conservatives if they could at least acknowledge that there are two governments active in the economy in Scotland, a point that's been denied in the past by uh, Dean Lockhart and others. There are two governments involved in this, and sometimes to have some reference to the role and perhaps some of the shortcomings of the UK government's involvement in the economy would be useful. But it is important, of course, that we keep under review productivity. We've seen an increase in Scotland, which we've not seen in the rest of the UK in terms of productivity. And in addition to that, as part of phase two of the review of the skills and enterprise agencies, we will look very closely at future targets and performance measures in relation to productivity. Question three has not been lodged. Question four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met South Lanarkshire Council and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Angel Constance. President Officer, ministers and officials regularly meet uh, the leaders and chief executives of all Scottish local authorities, uh, including South Lanarkshire Council, to discuss a variety of issues. Uh, senior officials attended the board meeting of South Lanarkshire Community Planning Partnership on the 27th of October, uh, along with the council's chief executive. Christina McKelvey. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer um, and uh, suggest to the Cabinet Secretary maybe that further meetings at Town Centre Regeneration should maybe be a focus of some of the work that, that the Government does along with local authorities. Angela Crawley MP and I have published a report on a consultation on Hamilton Town Centre. One of the recommendations is a, is a discrete town centre business bonus scheme to encourage new business and sustain existing business. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what financial levers councils can use to promote economic development and therefore regenerate town centres like Hamilton? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, uh, I'm sure Ms McKelvey is aware that the Small Business Bonus Scheme uh, already reduces non-domestic rates for more than two in every five uh, rateable properties across Scotland. And as a government, we have a commitment to uh, expand the scheme from 2017 so that it lifts uh, 100,000 properties out of rates altogether. 
There is also the new powers that councils have under the Community Empowerment Act uh, to apply further uh, rate reductions to any properties in their area. Uh, and Perth and Kinross Council is using uh, the power this year to support uh, its town centres. Uh, the Scottish Government's Town Centre Action Plan uh, remains a, a key driver of action uh, across government that sets the right conditions uh, for town centre regeneration in Scotland. And my final point, President Officer, is that we have been very encouraged uh, by the approach taken by uh, local authorities and wider public bodies to the town centre first principle uh, since its inception. Uh, and it's good to see town centres are being prioritised in public investment decisions, leading to positive change. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister may be aware that data protection has been cited as the reason why some councils, like South Lanarkshire, have made the decision to remove the displays of residents' names from the foyers of, towns of uh, tower blocks such as Wyler Tower. Residents, however, do wish their names in some cases to be displayed in order to aid deliveries and for routine emergency or doctor visits. So does the Minister therefore consider that these residents in, to comply with data protection should be given the option of having their names displayed and it should perhaps be part of their tenancy agreement? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a very interesting point uh, raised by uh, Ms Mitchell. Uh, I think, of course, we have to listen to uh, the needs of residents. Uh, and the member has outlined some very practical reasons why people would want uh, you know, their name displayed uh, outside uh, their own home. In particular, uh, she cited you know, uh, doctors doing emergency calls uh, and you know, for, to assist the, the ambulance service. Um, I'll certainly look into the issue that she raises uh, in and around data protection and to look at where you know, where a, a resolution lies, whether that lies at local level uh, or uh, with, with, within the Scottish Government's gift. Question number five, Andy Whitewin. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with tenant farmers and their representatives. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has frequent contact with tenant farmers and their representatives on a wide range of issues. Uh, I attend personally a large number of events, particularly farming shows over the summer, where I meet and have discussions with tenant farmers on a variety of topics. More specifically, I met the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association on the uh, 27th July to discuss tenant farming matters, including mediation, and I met them again this morning. I have met representatives from the NFU Scotland on 4th August, 5th September, 17th of October and 9th of November to discuss various matters, and I met Andrew Thin, the Interim Advisor on Tenant Farming, on the 29th of August. Tenant farmers were also represented at the last CAP stakeholder group I attended, and will be invited to attend rural summits I'm due to hold, including on farming and food production. Throughout this time, Presiding Officer, Scottish Government officials have also had substantive, significant contact with tenant farmers and their representatives on a range of matters. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you for that answer. As you're aware, probably aware, Presiding Officer, this was not my original question, uh, which I was advised may breach Rule 7.5 of standing orders. Um, two weeks today, tenant farmers' families will be evicted. We're in a situation where, because of the Scottish Government's failure to honour its own commitments to tenant farmers facing eviction, they've had to take ministers to court, and I now cannot, as a consequence, fulfil my parliamentary role of holding the Government to account for its actions. Will the Cabinet Secretary explain how we got into this situation? Will he commit to emergency legislation to halt these evictions pending proper mediation and compensation? And will he join me at 1pm to meet the tenant farmers affected outside Parliament and to receive a petition signed by 25,000 people calling for a halt to the eviction of the Patterson family on Arran? Just before the Cabinet Secretary answers the question, Mr Whiteman is referring to standing orders which refer to the subjudice rule. Uh, there is an active ongoing court case at the moment uh, and Parliament must be mindful not to interfere in, in judicial proceedings. Uh, having said that, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm mindful of those uh, uh, words and that advice, and I understand that uh, uh, I'm not permitted to make comment on these matters because legal proceedings are active in relation to a matter as prescribed in Section 2 of the Contempt of Court Act 1981. Therefore, I am constrained in what I may say about any matter which is subject to the current litigation. What I can say, however, to the member and every member in this chamber is that as the Rural Secretary, I am extremely 
uh, keen to do everything we possibly can uh, to help tenant farmers uh, and indeed all farmers in the community and see a thriving tenanted sector. Uh, and I can also assure all members that following resolution of the litigation, which prevents a, a, a more direct response on these matters, uh, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government will consider the outcome of that litigation with great care and no doubt will come back to this House as swiftly as we possibly can. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that while tenancy arrangements between landlords and tenants are private, in rural communities like those in Arnott, it's in everyone's interest for the land to be farmed productively, sustainably and effectively, and for those tenant farmers committed to food production, business diversification and land management to enjoy stability and security of tenure. While the Cabinet Secretary cannot talk about the cases currently in court, what general advice can he give to landlords and tenants who find themselves in dispute? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I, I think Mr Gibson makes the point very well, and I hope that all members across the Chamber and all parties will subscribe to the sentiments that he's expressed, namely that we wish, all of us wish to see a thriving agricultural sector, and that includes new entrants, crofters, smallholders, tenant farmers, owner-occupiers, or indeed landlords. Uh, and a vibrant tenant farming sector is one of the cornerstones of Scottish agriculture. In direct response to uh, the question about what advice I would offer, uh, uh, I would point out that the Scottish Government uh, uh, has provided mediation services. Uh, these are a matter, an entirely private matter between the tenant and landlords to contract. And in those cases where there is a live dispute, I would of course urge both parties to avail themselves of those mediation services. Uh, and that is uh, a, a general advice which we have sought to apply, presiding officer, in individual cases. John Scott. Thank you, presiding officer, and declaring an interest as a farmer, although not a tenant farmer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the declining supply of land to let in the tenanted sector, as predicted by Alex Ferguson and others in past sessions of Parliament. Can he assure Parliament that the Land Reform Act 2016 will increase the supply of tenanted land so vital for new entrants to the industry? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, th I think if I may say so, Mr Scott makes a very sensible point. Uh, I share that aspiration, as I hope do we all. Uh, and I can inform him that uh, I think it was just last week or the week before that I convened a meeting of uh, all public bodies that uh, have land holdings, uh, obviously including the Forestry Commission, but also uh, including bodies uh, such as Scottish Water, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, local authorities, with the specific remit of asking them to look at whether they have land within their land holdings, some of which could be made available for new entrants in future. It was an extremely positive meeting, uh, and I'd be delighted to, uh, to continue to work with Mr. Scott and members across the chamber in securing an objective that I think uh, we can all recognize as being in the interests of bringing in new entrants, not least presiding officer, because the average age of a farmer in Scotland, sadly, is 58. Uh, just one year less than my own age. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he is intending to amend the land reform legislation to make sure that those who should have security of tenure, tenure will have that going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, the, the topic of land, land reform has been closely <laughs> debated uh, in this Parliament, and I know that the member, Rhoda Grant, has taken... Uh, a, a long-standing and passionate interest in this, and I respect that. And of course, we are always looking at ways in which we can improve the legal framework in order to secure the objective of a thriving agricultural sector. And I'm able to state that uh, the Scottish Government is starting to implement much-needed changes in agricultural holding legislation. Uh, and just, last, uh, just uh, on Friday 11th November, the first SSIs will seek to implement aspects of the legislation last year. So I will continue to work with the member and others across the chamber in further improving the legislation affecting our farmers. Question number six, Gordon MacDonald. Scottish Government, how it plans to tackle traffic congestion in the west of Edinburgh? Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government has invested significantly in major schemes in the west of Edinburgh which contribute to reducing congestion. This includes the 41 million Edinburgh Gateway Station uh, due to open the 11th of December. 
Uh, since 2014, we provided grants for sustainable and active travel with 14 active travel projects uh, as well. Transport Scotland also works with the City of Edinburgh Council through the development plan process to ensure the continued safe and efficient operation of the road network. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. The A70 and A71 are the two main arterial routes into Edinburgh through my constituency. Over the last five years, there has been an 18 per cent increase in the number of buses, coaches and light goods vehicles using the A70 through the villages of Balerno, Curry and Juniper Green. In total, close to 45,000 vehicle journeys daily on those two main roads. With ongoing house building in West Lothian all commutable into Edinburgh, how can we encourage more use of public transport in order that communities along the route of the A70 and A71 are not further impacted by increased traffic congestion? Minister. The member makes a, a very good point indeed that congestion is affecting our urban areas, and in that vein, officials are working closely with regional and local planning and transport authorities to undertake a cross-boundary multimodal transport study. Uh, this will assess the impact of current and projected travel demand, but also take into account uh, some of those uh, housing proposals and the local development plan that the member uh, mentions. Uh, the current phase of the Edinburgh-Glasgow improvement project, electrification of the short lines, will result in journey saving times and additional capacity. I have mentioned the Gateway Station. There are also opportunities in the transport bill and the, the upcoming transport bill to see how we can improve bus patronage and also deal with the issue of roadworks, which also add uh, to congestion issues. I will keep the member fully briefed uh, on that. Thank you. That concludes